In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. The tempter approached and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. He said in reply, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their magnificence. And he said to him, All these I shall give to you if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. At this Jesus said to him, Begone, Satan, it is written, The Lord your God shall you worship and him alone shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. In our last session, I mentioned that there are three separate but related parts of deep conversion. The conversion from deep sin, or mortal sin, the conversion from shallow or venial sin, and the purification and conversion from our attachment to sin, which includes our attachment from anything which distracts us from giving our whole mind, our whole heart, and all our strength to God. This evening, I'll begin our practical step-by-step -step guide to overcoming sin as a means of continuing to journey out into the deep, into greater intimacy with the living God. As I said last time, I'll be presenting these points from the perspective of overcoming mortal sin, but they apply to venial sin as well, so they are for each and every one of us. And I'm going to call this phase of our journey, Seven Steps to Breaking the Chains of Mortal Sin. This is going to be a long leg of our journey. We're actually only going to complete point one next time but I hope it's going to be a very helpful and a very practical one. The seven steps or pointers that I'll be dealing with, just to kind of give you a sense of where we're going to be headed. First, be determined, be determined not to give in to temptation. Second, avoid self-reliance, which is to say that you will give in to temptation if you trust in yourself and not rely wholly on God. Third, encounter Jesus Christ. This seem, might seem like a, an obvious point, but I think we could all say that we know something about Jesus Christ. But do we really know Jesus Christ? Do we have a real intimate relationship with him? So this point will include uh, further discussion on prayer, on, of course, frequenting the sacraments, especially Eucharist and confession. Point four is practice the opposite virtue. We'll talk about that in a, a lot more detail. Number five, don't give in to discouragement. Number six, penance, penance, penance. And we'll talk about why the three times penance um, when we get to that point. I'll just give you a hint at this point. It's related to point number seven, true and genuine devotion to Our Lady. So this is, those are the seven steps that we'll be talking about over the course of the summer. But first, we'll begin with, be determined not to give in to temptation. The first part of not falling into sin is understanding how to react when we are tempted to sin. To begin with, we have to understand that temptation is part and parcel of the human condition. And by temptation, I mean an attraction either from outside oneself or from within to act contrary to right reason and the commandments of God. We should say up front that not all temptation 
is a demonic attack. And for the most part, we can probably say that most temptation is not a demonic attack. It stems from our weakened nature, which we've inherited from our first parents who fell in the Garden of Eden. Um, it's not to say that temptation is never uh, an assault of the evil one, but um, we shouldn't uh, be prone to, to attribute all of our temptations to, to Satan. We can't get away with, uh, the devil made me do it. Uh, it didn't work for Adam and Eve. It doesn't work for us either. The more we strive to progress in the spiritual life, the more we will be tempted. I think there's kind of a, a misnomer uh, in, in certain circles that the more holy we become, the less we're tempted. But it really doesn't work that way. Uh, the more holy we become, the more we'll be tempted. We'll see why that is as we progress. And we just, of course, we just heard in the Gospel of St. Matthew that Jesus was tempted. He was tempted before he began his public ministry. He was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was um, tempted probably throughout his ministry. And if Jesus was tempted, we can't hope to avoid it. But we can hope in him to overcome as he did. And we're so fortunate in this regard that we have a God who became man like us in all things but sin. Not only to save us and to reveal the fathomless depths of his love and mercy for us, but also to give us an example, also to instruct us. The curé of ours, St. John Vianney, who's the patron saint of parish priests, expressed this sentiment beautifully. How fortunate we are, how lucky to have a God as a model. Are we being tempted by the demon? We have our lovable Redeemer. He also was tempted by the demon and twice taken up by that hellish spirit. Therefore, no matter what the sufferings, pains, or temptations we're experiencing, we always have, everywhere, our God leading the way for us and assuring us of victory as long as we genuinely desire it. St. Paul says likewise in his letter to the Hebrews, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace for timely help. We all know, I'm sure, that life is a battle full of trial and temptation. Something many people are ignorant of, but it's a fact that we are at war. Each and every one of us here is at war. And our everyday life is our battlefield. We are soldiers enlisted in the army of God. Your first reaction to that might, might be, now I don't remember signing on for that. When did that happen? And if you were baptized as an infant, you probably don't remember because we enlist in the army of God at baptism. So every day we face a multitude of choices, more than we can count probably. Choices between good, better, and best, between good and evil, sin and sanctity. In the book of Job, we read that the life of man upon earth is a warfare. And if you've read the book of Job, you know that he knew what he was talking about. But Job is not talking about physical warfare. He's talking about spiritual warfare, spiritual combat. St. Paul says in Ephesians 6.12, For our struggle is not with flesh and blood, meaning physical enemies, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, with evil spirits in the heavens. This is to say spiritual enemies, tempting us to sin against God. Now, I've never been in a war, but I would have to think that a couple of the indispensable qualities of someone who's involved in physical combat would be a will to live, determination to survive. And that, if that is true in a physical sense, it is doubly true and more in a spiritual sense because what's at stake for us isn't the death of our physical bodies, but the life or death of our immortal souls. 
We fight against a determined enemy who is cunning and cruel. The devil and his minions, as Jesus said, the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. So if we hope to resist, we have to put on the whole armor of God. And if we hope not merely to resist, but b to be victorious, we should do so. And hopefully we're not hoping just to be victorious, but to be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect, as we've said from the beginning of the series. Persevering in our resistance to temptation is a prerequisite to growing in holiness, to growing in intimacy with the living God. We must be a consecrated pure and holy dwelling place for the Most High God. And we all fall, at least on occasion. We've been conditioned by our habits of sin, whether we have little habits of sin or great ones. As I said in the beginning, owing to the weakness of our fallen nature, to do what we don't want to do. We want to be holy, but there's something within us which kind of on occasion kind of drags us down, our fallen nature. St. Paul acknowledged this struggle when he said in his letter to the Romans, I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. We must constantly struggle against our fallen nature, which tends to the indulgence and the comforts of the flesh and not to God. But how do we do it? How do we conquer temptation? The simple answer, which we're going to again expand on over these next two sessions, is, as we've said in the last, last three sessions, by cooperating with God's grace, by disposing ourselves properly to the work of God within us. Psalm 18.30 says, You, O Lord, are my lamp, my God who lightens my darkness. With you, I can break through any barrier. With my God, I can scale any wall. And so the best way for us to proceed is to observe how Jesus acted when he was tempted. He himself says, I have given you an example that you should also do as I have done. So we're going to enter into the desert here and see what we can learn from the divine master. Jesus himself, about conquering temptation. And the temptations of Jesus help us to answer three questions. First, why does God permit temptation in the first place? And sort of a secondary point on that, was how, how does, uh, or why did Jesus allow himself to be tempted? You could also say, was Jesus really tempted? Second, how does temptation work? And third, how can we be victorious over temptation? So first, why does God permit temptation? Let's clear the second part of that question up to begin with. Jesus allowed himself to be tempted. And he was really tempted without the aid of his divinity. St. Ambrose, who is a uh, 4th century bishop of Milan, doctor of the church, not to mention one of God's most significant instruments in bringing Augustine, a future saint and a doctor of the church himself, to the faith, had this to say about Jesus' temptations. He said, Jesus did not act as God, bringing his power into play. If he had done so, how could we have availed of his example? Rather, as a man, he made use of the resources which he has in common with us. So Jesus allowed the temptation in order to reveal his love for us and also to instruct us. By courageously submitting himself to temptation, he shows us that we should not be afraid of temptation, but view it as an opportunity. An opportunity to grow in the practice of the love of God, in fidelity to his truth and his perfect will, and as well as the perfection of holiness within us. In Zechariah 13:9, we read, I will bring them through fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will test them as gold is tested. They shall call upon my name, and I will hear them. 
I will say, they are my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Just as fire tries gold, man is tried in the fires of temptation. It was so for Christ, and it is so for us. Our reaction to temptation reveals if we are found worthy or wanting. Again, if he who is perfect allowed himself to be tempted, surely we who are far from perfect will be tempted as well. But we're going to try and answer why exactly. I think that the answer to the why of temptation is tied up with another million dollar spiritual question. Why does God let bad things happen? So you'll hopefully get, uh, I wouldn't say two million dollars worth of answers here, but uh, we'll shoot a little below that, but I think we'll be able to answer at least one of those. I think the way that we can begin to understand it is by looking at the fact that God's stock in trade is making good things come out of bad things. He allows bad things to happen to bring about a greater good. It's the only reason that God permits bad things to happen. He permits something like temptation. We might not always see that good immediately. We may not even see it until the end of time, but it is certainly there. St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, one of my favorite quotes from St. Paul, kind of gives a sense of this mystery about God's will, but the truth of it and the goodness of it as well. He says, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How inscrutable are his judgments, how unsearchable his ways. The best example of this, again, trying to answer the question, why does God allow bad things to happen, and also why does God allow temptation, is the passion and death of Jesus Christ. Deicide, the death of the God-man. Jesus is true God and true man. Killing him was the greatest evil ever perpetrated by sinful man, and that the greatest evil that will ever be perpetrated by sinful man. And we've done some doozies, but this is, takes the cake forever and ever. But through that great evil, God brought about the greatest good imaginable, the ransom of sinful man from the penalty of death that he deserved, revealing his great love and his mercy for us in the process. Another excellent example from Scripture is the case of Job. Job was a great, prosperous servant of the Lord who endured absolutely dreadful hardships, including the loss of family, health, wealth, property, social standing, as well as the temptation to abandon the faith of his ancestors. But because of his fidelity to God in the midst of all these trials, in the midst of all these temptations, God used these adversities to raise Job up to twice the prosperity that he enjoyed previously. And I think that temptation is similar. Through it, God allows us to prove our loyalty, our commitment to be his disciples, to reveal and give living witness to our love for him, to choose the good, the true, the beautiful, to be perfected in him, in the process following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, who endured the cross to bring us with him to new and everlasting life. The Book of Wisdom says, As gold in the furnace he proved them, and as sacrificial offerings he took them to himself. In the time of their visitation they shall shine, and shall dart about as sparks through stubble. God permits us to endure the assaults of the evil one to endure temptation and trial, that we may shine brilliantly in the world, darting about as sparks through a parched and weary land, starving for the truth, that we may set it aflame with his glory. As his instruments, our simple and often silent witness to our faith and our trust in him, even in the midst of suffering, not only brings others to faith through grace, but wins for us an imperishable crown. 
St. Francis of Assisi said, Temptation overcome is, in a way, a ring with which the Lord espouses the soul of his servant to himself. There are many who flatter themselves over their long-standing merits and are happy because they have had to undergo no temptations. But because fright itself would crush them even before the struggle, they should know that their weakness has been taken into consideration by the Lord. For difficult struggles are hardly ever put in the way of anyone except where virtue has been perfected. We also read in 1 Corinthians 10:13. He will not let you be tested beyond your strength. Now, while all this hopefully is, is consoling, gives us reason for hope that our temptation is not in vain, at first brush, it may seem a little tough to take that we're kind of doomed to be in God's fifth grade forever, always being tested. Um, you know, we might feel like you know, we're never going to make progress. But God is not masochistic. He doesn't allow us to be tested for his own amusement. It is a practical means for our sanctification. And I think a good way to look at it is, if we've never had the opportunity to say no, how valuable is our yes? In saying an unequivocal no to temptation... We prove our fealty and devotion as disciples of Jesus Christ. Another way to look at it is that uh, we, we've said we're, we're all soldiers in the army of God. A soldier cannot decide when or where he wants to fight or she wants to fight. They trust that their general knows what he's doing. So must we. And we have the added bonus of knowing that our general is both all-powerful and all-knowing. So it should be a little bit easier for us to, to trust in him who leads us. Again, St. Francis of Assisi thought it essential for we who are enlisted in God's army to prove our mettle in battle, so to speak. He went so far as to say to a fellow brother, I tell you in all truth, no one must consider himself a servant of God until... He has undergone temptations and tribulations. And again, we're abundantly blessed because our general, our God, does not merely send us into battle. He leads the way. He also shows us how to fight and how to win the victory. We know that he has already won the victory. All we have to do is put our strength and our trust in him. As we read in the prophet Isaiah... This is the one whom I approve, the lowly and afflicted man who trembles at my word. St. Francis de Sales, who we've spoken about in previous sessions, says, God never permits such grievous temptations and assaults to try any, save those souls whom he designs to lead on to his own living highest love. We talked about that in the session number two the spiritual marriage, the transforming union, the heights of transformation in Christ. I would warn you of this, my child, so that should you ever be tried by great temptations, you may know that God is showing a special favor to you. It may not seem like that when we're enduring them, but God is showing us a special favor at that time, thereby proving that he means to exalt you in his sight, but that at the same time you may ever be humble and full of holy fear. This is what Isaiah was saying in the previous passage. Not overconfident in your power to resist lesser temptations because you have overcome those that were greater, unless by means of a most steadfast faithfulness to God. So we don't often see the, the hand of God in permitting the trials and temptations that we face. But again, there's some consolation in this message that if he allows trials to be our lot that he has lovingly designed it so for our good, for our sanctification, for our perfection in him, difficult though it may be see, uh, to see at the time.
Another one of my favorite saints who we're going to be hearing a lot more from uh, in subsequent sessions is St. Alphonsus de Liguori. He was an 18th century saint, uh, bishop, doctor of the church, uh, founder of the religious congregation, the Redemptorists. He has a little bit of practical advice. Because he, has a lot, he has a lot of practical advice, but this is just a, a sampling. He says, God permits us to be tempted that we may be more detached from the things of earth and conceive a more ardent desire to behold him in heaven. God also permits us to be tempted in order to increase our merits. It harkens to St. Francis' quote that we read earlier, temptation overcome is like a ring with which we're espoused to God. When it is disturbed by temptation and sees itself in danger of committing sin, the soul has recourse to the Lord and to his blessed mother. That soul renews its determination to die rather than to offend God. It humbles itself and takes refuge in the arms of divine mercy. By this means, as is proved by experience, it acquires more strength and is united more closely to God. And finally, on this first point, St. Peter says in his first encyclical letter, Rejoice, rejoice in the measure that you share Christ's sufferings. When his glory is revealed, you will rejoice exultantly. And this, I think, perfectly summarizes the third and fourth, quote-unquote, rules of the spiritual journey that we spoke about a few sessions ago. If you recall, point number three is, Suffering is part of the deal. Point four, that suffering is infinitely worth it. We should rejoice in the measure, measure that we share Christ's sufferings because when his glory is revealed, we will rejoice. So much for point one um, on what we can learn from Jesus' temptation. Second, how does temptation work? Jesus' three temptations in the desert encompass every kind of human temptation. The angelic doctor, the great Dominican doctor of the church, 13th century, St. Thomas Aquinas, said, Scripture would not have said that once all the temptations ended, the devil departed from him, unless the matter of all sins were included in the three temptations already related. For the cause, causes of temptation are the causes of desires, namely lust of the flesh, desire for glory, eagerness of power. So by conquering every kind of temptation, Jesus shows us how temptation comes at us and also how to overcome the snares and tricks of the devil as well as our own weak nature can't get through a session without quoting John Paul II. In his encyclical, The Rosary of the Virgin Mary, John Paul says, Jesus encounters all the temptations and confronts all the sins of humanity in order to say to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. This yes of Christ reverses the no of our first parents in the Garden of Eden. And so the faithfulness of Christ to the will of the Father is a great support to us. For as St. Paul says, because he himself was tested through what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Temptation is Satan's attempt, or again, just a, a byproduct of our fallen nature, to use circumstances of our, uh, our weakness, circumstances that we, we face in our lives, to try to trust, or to encourage us, I should say, to trust more in Him than God. It's His way of encouraging us to think that His way, or we might even say our way for that matter, is better than God's way. Our rejection of temptation is our way of saying, with Christ, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Our rejection of temptation is our filial yes to God's perfect will for our lives. In it we join with Jesus in the desert, in the garden, and on the cross. 
and we are espoused to him and found ever more pleasing in his sight. Our rejection of temptation and the wiles of the evil one is one way in which we submit to the hammer and chisel of the divine artist we've spoken about before, as well as the scalpel of the divine physician. So then practically speaking, how does temptation work? How can we kind of see it coming down the road so we may block it more effectively? It comes at us in three stages. Understanding them is a good means of beginning to understand how to defeat them. We can see each of these stages in Jesus' temptation in the desert. I'm just going to go into them a little bit in some detail. And I hope that the analysis will help us to wage war more effectively on sin and not on ourselves. As I said last time, scrupulosity is the enemy of spiritual progress. It's one way that Satan uses to trick us into chasing our own tail, you might say stressing us out about what's not, tr not truly sinful, so as to distract us from what is truly sinful. So the three parts of temptation that we're going to look at. First, the proposal. The proposal of something sinful. Second, our initial response, which is to say, are we delighted by that proposal, or are we repulsed by it? And then third, our consent, or our denial of that temptation. So the first part of any temptation is the proposal. We might call this the sinful suggestion, whereby the devil attempts to entice us away from the will of the Father with the illusion of something better, more pleasurable, more satisfying, which is against God's plan. I think before I continue, I want to just distinguish between emotion and willed action as a means of determining whether or not temptation has led us into sin. To a certain degree, our emotions are beyond our control, to a certain degree. They're similar to impulses. Satan often takes advantage of our weakness, or as I said before, certain circumstances to tempt us to sin. At other times, it's our weak nature which encourages us to err. But merely enduring temptation is not in itself a sin. Many proposals of temptation are similar to emotional impulses. For example, hey! Now, you couldn't control your reaction to that assault on your ears. But you all controlled your willed response, which probably was to throw some sharp object at me or to think something uncharitable in your minds or something along those lines. So it's what we do with the sinful proposal that constitutes vice or virtue. We cannot stop the devil from making sinful propositions. We can't wholly overcome our fallen nature that inclines us to sin but we can control how we react to those temptations. For example, I'm leisurely driving down the road. And by the way, there are many examples of temptation that involve driving. I'm driving down the highway when some cowboy cuts me off and then continues to weave his way through traffic at breakneck speed. My first thought may be one that I shouldn't say out loud. If I don't say it out loud, it's a good start. But I do think about how drivers from a certain state are dangerous and proceed to give myself an internal monologue on this person. Have I sinned against charity? Well, assuming that I know that willfully thinking uncharitable thoughts is sinful, and if you didn't before, now you do, yes, that is a sin. But to distinguish, feeling angry is not a sin. Being bad-tempered, willfully thinking uncharitable thoughts about someone, using foul language, worse yet, taking the Lord's name in vain, those things are sinful. 
This next example is kind of funny. After I wrote this example, that afternoon, it, it, this thing happened to me. It's kind of interesting. I'm driving through town when the slowest driver on the planet pulls out of a business right in front of me and proceeds to go about 15 miles an hour below the speed limit. My immediate reaction is, come on pal, it's the pedal on the right. This isn't a parade. But after thinking it, before I yell it out the window or begin to be uncharitable in my mind, I thank the Lord sincerely for this opportunity to practice the virtue of patience. Have I sinned? Well, no. I met the temptation to impatience and uncharity and by the grace of God, I rebuked it. I seized this simple, ordinary opportunity, solely by the grace of God, to grow in love. So again, to distinguish, feeling impatient is not a sin. Acting impatient is. Using biting words, being rude or bad-tempered, making uncharitable or sarcastic comments, again, persisting in uncharitable thoughts about someone, these are all controllable responses to the temptation to act on our impatient feelings. And so they are sinful. One more example. An immodest commercial comes on TV at halftime of the football game. I realize in an instant that if I look at this, I'm likely to sin against purity. I look away. But I have seen it. Is this a sin? Well, no. I wasn't deliberately watching something impure. I wasn't courting temptation. I met temptation and I rebuked it as soon as I was aware of it. But now, I'm tempted to recall this image to my mind, to think about it. If I do this, do I sin? Yes. So in voluntarily being presented with an impure image, whether it's a commercial we aren't expecting, or someone who is dressed immodestly, who walks in our line of sight, or even an impure thought that comes into our mind, is not in itself a sin. Entertaining that thought, so to speak, entertaining that image, dwelling on it, willingly recalling it to mind, is a sin. I think a good shorthand for this is, the key to both vice and virtue is the will. We must make a conscious decision to do or not to do something, to dwell on a sinful thought or not, to avert our eyes from a potentially sinful sight or not, to speak rudely at someone or not, to have that extra piece of pie even though I know I'm full or not, to have that third mixed drink even though I know I've had enough or not. So a simple shorthand summary on all this is no will, no sin. No will, no sin. And you could also say no virtue either. Accidental virtue isn't virtue. St. Francis of Sales offers this consoling advice in summary about temptation. If we should undergo the temptation to every sin whatsoever during our whole life, it would not damage us in the sight of God, God's majesty, provided we took no pleasure in it and did not consent to it. And this is a great line, very encouraging. Because in temptation we do not act, we only suffer. And inasmuch as we take no delight in it, we can be liable to no blame. So let the enemies of our salvation spread as many snares and wiles in our way as they will. Let them besiege the door of our heart perpetually. Let them ply us with endless proposals to sin, so long as we abide in our firm resolution to take no pleasure therein, we cannot offend God. In his spiritual classic, The Imitation of Christ, Thomas Akempis has some very useful advice to summarize this first stage of temptation. He says, above all, we must be especially alert against the beginnings of temptation. For the enemy is more easily conquered if he has refused admittance to the mind and is met beyond the threshold when he knocks. Someone has said very aptly, resist beginnings 
remedies come too late, when by long delay the evil has gained strength. First a mere thought comes to mind, then strong imagination, followed by pleasure, evil delight, and consent. Thus, because he is not resisted in the beginning, Satan gains full entry. And the longer a man delays in resisting, so much the weaker does he become each day, while the strength of the enemy grows against him. And we could add that the opposite is true as well. The more we practice virtue, the stronger we go, grow each day. The stronger we remain in Christ to resist temptation. The second phase of temptation is our initial reaction. We've kind of touched on this already. We react to temptation with either delight or revulsion. If once we are aware of a sinful proposal, whether it be against purity, charity, temperance, whatever, if we take delight in it, even if we do not actually consent to it, there is some sinfulness there. Ideally, when we're tempted with some sinful suggestion, we'll not only not consent to it, we'll be repulsed by it. Not only will we rebuke it and not even consider it, but we'll actually find it disgusting. This revulsion at the thought of sin comes after we cultivate that habit of virtue. And again, as I said earlier, in the next session, I'll we'll be talking about practical ways to achieve that. And we can see this revulsion at the proposition of temptation in Christ's temptation in the desert. As we said before, he did not act as God, but as man. He allowed himself to be tempted to give us an example. He could have taken Satan up on his offer. But his offer, which might look really good to us, you know, global power, world domination, uh, endless pleasure and prestige, this was repulsive to him. To us, even though we might reject those same temptations, they might look like filet mignon, to put it mildly. A really, really nice idea. We might kind of imagine what it might be like. What would we do with such power and so forth? To Jesus, it didn't look like filet mignon. It looked like a moldy, half-eaten cheeseburger. He could have taken a bite, but... Why would he? As we grow in virtue, the same thing will happen to us. We'll still be tempted, but sin will look gradually less and less appealing to us. And this, again, is a hopeful thought. The more we choose the good, the true, and the beautiful, the more we cultivate a holy habit of virtue and reject what is evil, false and ugly, the more these temptations which come from our fallen nature and other temptations which are more overt attacks of the enemy will look up repulsive to us. The third level of temptation is consent or denial. We don't need to say a whole lot about this. It's kind of self-explanatory. Giving knowing consent to an evil impulse or temptation is always sinful. It affects the deepest part of our soul and our relationship with God. Depending on the gravity of the matter involved, Consent to temptation constitutes sin, either venial sin or mortal sin. So just to review, the first part of temptation, the proposition, there's no sin at all. If you reject the proposals altogether, giving no consideration or consent, we do not sin. We are more or less sinful to the degree that we take delight in the proposal once we're aware of it, or worse still, give consent to it. So it's our task, as soon as we're aware of the presence of the enemy in our midst, so to speak, to refute him just as Jesus did. Be gone, Satan. Again, if we do that, we do not sin. But how do we do it? How can we better dispose ourselves to the action of God's grace and cooperate with him so we may more and more be like him in all things, even in the midst of trial and temptation? And this leads us to our final teaching point on Jesus' temptations. How can we be victorious over temptation? And I'll present on that next time with ten practical tips to resist temptation. Keep it very practical. 
So to kind of sum up, we can benefit immensely from temptation. It's not often thought of in that light, but it's true. In it we find the opportunity to choose the kingdom of God over the kingdom of the, of the devil. By conquering temptation, we grow in love of God and trust in Him, overcoming our own weakened will and our fallen nature, and we espouse ourselves ever more intimately to His love and His perfect will. I want to close with just one more exhortation from Thomas Akempis from The Imitation of Christ. If you've never read that, by the way, it's a really good devotional read. I think it still ranks second to the Bible all time in Christian book sales. It's, it's really, really good. He says, Let us humble our souls under the hand of God in every trial and, and temptation, for he will save and exalt the humble in spirit. In temptations and trials, the progress of a man is measured. In them, opportunity for merit and virtue is made more manifest. Temptations, though troublesome and severe, are often useful to a man, for in them he is humbled, purified, and instructed. The saints all pass through many temptations and trials to profit by them. And saints is what each of us hopes to be. So let us bear up under the temptations that we face, the trials and sufferings that we face in our everyday lives, and trust and cooperate with the grace and strength of Almighty God, who will uphold us in times of trouble if we put our trust in Him. Next time, we'll conclude our examination of what we can, uh, how we can benefit from the temptations of Christ, what we can learn by them, and apply them to our own lives. As again, we cover those ten simple and practical ways that we can overcome temptation and trial in our everyday lives.